We said that the Imam instructs his son and advises his son to have piety, to guard himself against the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by following his instructions and his commandments. The Imam then says to him, revive your heart with maw'adha. And maw'adha means advice that has to do with the grander values. In other words, advice that you should brush your teeth at least twice a day is good advice. And that's something that you should heed, you should listen to. And we have traditions, in fact, where the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt have said that if someone is clinically insane, but offers you good advice, don't throw garbage on the road. That's good advice. That's common sense advice. When heeding this kind of advice, it doesn't matter who the person offering the advice happens to be. In another version of the hadith, the Imam says, if a dog gives you good advice, take it. If a kafir, a disbeliever gives you good advice, take it. There's nothing wrong in doing so. However, the Imam here is talking about maw'adha. And maw'adha is the antidote to distraction, which we addressed in the previous two lectures. It is to remind you of the fact that this world is but a small part of a gigantic divine plan for humanity. This world is just not worth investing every fiber of your being into. You're worth a lot more than that. Amir al-Mu'mineen says in a beautiful hadith, he says that you are more valuable, more precious than to burn in the fires of hell. In other words, this takes a completely different approach to being good and avoiding evil. Instead of telling us that by committing acts of sin, you will go to hell and you will burn in the inferno, the Imam is adopting a fatherly approach. He says, listen, you're worth a lot more than that. You're better than that. Mawa'adha is advice that awakens you to the reality of this life. So the Imam tells his son, he says, revive your heart with this kind of advice. And that obviously means surrounding yourself with good, righteous, moral, wise friends. It means being very deliberate when it comes to the choice of your friends and acquaintances. Obviously, there are people that you have to interact with as part of your job, as part of your study, right? You have your classmates, you have your work colleagues, and those are people you have to interact with on a daily basis. But don't take them as friends unless they check all those boxes of what a good friend is supposed to be. A good friend is someone who is truthful with you, one hadith says. Sadiquka man sadaqak la man sadaqak. The Imam says your friend is the one who is truthful to you, who's honest to you, who tells you when you make a mistake. Not someone who believes everything you tell them. Not someone who validates every action that emanates from you, right? There are many, many hadiths dealing with the question of what a good friend is. The point here is that you should surround yourself with people who are wise and who are pious and righteous so that they could provide you with this advice. Or to stay in contact with pious and righteous and learned ulama, scholars, Traditions tell us that it's an, a good deed. In other words, you'll be rewarded for simply looking in the face of a righteous scholar. Another hadith goes even further and says that looking at the doorknob of the house of a pious scholar is a deed for which you will be rewarded. In other words, all of these traditions are encouraging us to go and 
spend time with these scholars, ask them our questions. The other day in the youth Q&A, I mentioned the hadith where the imam says, nas, what causes people to perish and to lose out in the afterlife is the fact that they don't ask questions. They don't ask questions when they don't know. And when they do know, it could be compound ignorance. Who knows that I know the answer to these questions, even though I assume to do so. In other words, seeking advice from scholars, validating your opinions with them, going back and forth to the ulama is a critical thing. And that is one means of reviving the heart with good advice. In other words, the imam says, go and seek it out. Don't just wait for it to come. Now, some people's idea of good advice or maw'adha is things they hear from mystics. Many times, and this is not just sad, but downright tragic and catastrophic for our faith. When the pulpit of Rasulullah, this blessed institution established by the Holy Prophet, is used in order to speak and to communicate the things that were stated by mystics, Sufis, because they have the allure, they have the appearance of possessing good advice. The name of Rumi, unfortunately, is familiar to too many of us. A lot of people are ignorant about not just the intricate details of the lives of the Imams السلام, and the Holy Prophet above all, but sometimes major details about the lives of the Ahlul Bayt. People don't know them. But almost everyone has heard the name Rumi. Even though Rumi was without a doubt, without question, a deviant of the worst type. He is someone who accuses Abu Talib of dying as a mushrik. That alone should disqualify his name from ever getting anywhere near a member. Because the belief of Abu Talib, and we spoke a little bit about him a couple of nights ago, the fact that Abu Talib was one of the greatest believers, was a defender of Islam and the Holy Prophet. This is a matter of Consensus among the Shia. Every Shia scholar since the greater occultation to this day believes that Abu Talib and with plenty of evidence Abu Talib was a believer. And so when someone like Rumi comes along and says that he died as a disbeliever shouldn't that be enough to recognize the fraudster that he was? The imposter that he was? What kind of wisdom can a person like this give me? having accused Abu Talib of dying as a mushrik. What? Rumi even goes as far as to defend the shaitan. He says that when shaitan refused to prostrate before Adam as instructed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he did so not out of disbelief. Rather, he was jealous. Like when a child loves their father, if that father takes another child into their embrace and shows them love and compassion and so forth, this child will become jealous. Because they love the father so much, they now exhibit traits of jealousy. Shaitan loved God too much and that's why he became jealous. And yet, look at what the Quran says about Shaitan, فَسَجَدُوا إِلَّا Iblis. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded the angels to prostrate before Adam. فَسَجَدُوا They all prostrated إِلَّا Iblis with the exception of Shaitan. Aba وَاسْتَكْبَرْ He refused. He was arrogant. وَكَانَ مِنَ الْكَافِرِينَ He was a kafir. And Rumi says, he was just jealous. He loved God too much. Rumi is the same person who says that Ibn Muljam will go to heaven. The killer of Amir al muminin He says, the Imam told him that I will give you my intercession. I'll intercede for you on the day of judgment. I mean, brothers and sisters, 
How much evidence do we require before we recognize this imposter and people like him? And yet, his name is still mentioned on the pulpit of the Ahlul Bayt And so, another instance of Rumi's deviation, you're all familiar with the hadith, where Rasulullah said that my nation will be split into 73 sects. They will all perish except for one. It's a hadith mentioned in both Shia and Sunni sources. You're also familiar with the hadith where Rasulullah said, now, if the Holy Prophet is telling us that most of the denominations, most of the sects will deviate, surely he's going to give us some indication as to which sect survives. And he's done so repeatedly. In one of those hadith, the Holy Prophet said, إِنَّمَا مَثَلُ أَهْلِ بَيْتِي كَسَفِينَةِ نُوح مَنْ رَكِبَهَا نَجَا وَمَنْ تَخَلَّفَ عَنْهَا غَرَقَ وَهَوَى My family, the example of my family is that of the Ark of Nuh. Whoever boards it will survive. Whoever fails to board it will perish and drown. Rumi takes this hadith and twists it. He says, Ya Rasulullah said to the people that you will all deviate except for one group. How do you survive? He then said, I am the ship and so are my companions. Instead of the holy household of Rasulullah, he introduces the companions as the Ark of Salvation. I mean, at some point, as followers of the Ahlul Bayt, we should draw a line in the sand and say, we're not going to take from a person who has all of these beliefs and this is just a few samples that I mentioned to you. I remember once I spoke about Rumi's proclivities or to be more specific his sexual orientation which was deviant and he openly talks about it. He had a special relationship with a person named Shamsa Tabrizi and he speaks about it in rather blunt terms. I spoke about this, I mentioned some of his devia deviant beliefs. I got off the pulpit, there was a whole queue of people saying to me, is that true? How could that be possible? Rumi, we've heard about him for so many years. This uh, other philosopher quotes him, this poet quotes him. And I thought to myself, subhanAllah, I am providing all of this evidence. People rightly come to me and challenge me on the statements that I've made and I welcome that. But how is it that when someone quotes Rumi on the pulpit, no one challenges them? How is it that when someone dares to praise people who exhibited hatred towards the Ahlul Bayt like Ibn Arabi and others, their names are mentioned on the pulpit, no one challenges them. It's a sad, sad state of affairs that we're in. Anyway, Amir al-Mu'mineen then says, after he speaks about reviving your heart with good advice, he then says, وَأَمِتْهُ بِالزَّهَادَةِ See, the heart has two components to it. One component which has to be revived and fed and rejuvenated. And that's the part where the, where the Imam addresses as needing good advice. The Imam also says, you should kill your heart. So a part has to be revived, another part has to be killed, has to be subdued and subjugated. The Imam says, kill your heart with zuhd. The idea that your austerity, asceticism, the idea that you should not be too attached to this world. And I want to mention a hadith in which Imam Sadiq, our sixth Imam, explains what asceticism actually is, right? In a nutshell. Because a lot of people confuse asceticism with not having any possessions. Whether it be a nice house, a nice car, nice clothes, these sorts of things. Nobody said that. If anything, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran, قُلْ Tell them, مَنْ حَرَّمَتْ زِينَةَ اللَّهِ Who forbade the ornaments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He presented to the people? If anything, Allah created all the good things in this life for the believers. Sure. They are shared with everybody. In this world, everybody shares the beautiful things in this world. 
Perhaps others get a bigger share than the rest of us. In the afterlife, it's purely for the believers. And so this misconstrued idea about asceticism, Imam al-Sadiq addresses in this hadith. He says, Az-Zuhdu, to be an ascetic, means this, Tarkuka kulla shay'in yashghaluka anillah. What a beautiful description. He says, avoiding everything that distracts you from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In other words, when it turns into an excess, when it's too much, and you're not able to reconcile between all of the things that you enjoy, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, His remembrance, His duties, His obligations, your financial duties towards other people, the second you feel like you cannot reconcile between these two, that's the point at which you stop. And if you do so, you become an ascetic. تَرْكُكَ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ يَشْغَلُكَ عَنِ اللَّهِ مِنْ غَيْرِ تَأَسْتُفٍ عَلَى فَوْتِهَا Also, to be an ascetic is when you lose something, your possessions, your money, whatever it is that you have, when you lose it, how do you know you're not overly attached to it. The Imam says, you don't feel too sorry when you lose it. In other words, you lost it, you lost it. So be it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives and He takes. So number one, and this is a reference to the verse in the Quran, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لِكَيْ لَا تَأْسَوْ عَلَى مَا فَاتَكُمْ وَلَا تَفْرَحُوا بِمَا آتَاكُمْ They asked Amir al-Mu'mineen, is there a verse that speaks about asceticism and zuhd. The Imam said this verse, when you don't feel sorry for losing the things that you have, and you're not overjoyed when you gain new things. When you get something, you get it, fine, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen. Of course, people become happy if you made a profit in a trade, if you got a bigger house, if you got a nicer car, people are happy, but don't be overjoyed. The Imam says, Zuhd and asceticism is when you don't feel too sorry when you lose something. And when you avoid certain things, you don't feel good about yourself. That's number three. And don't expect when you get something that your problems will be solved. And that's how many people feel, especially young people. Let's say, for example, a teenager who doesn't have their driver's license, doesn't have a car, right? They think that the minute they get their driver's license, I mean, that day to them is like a day of absolute joy. And they feel that now all their problems are solved. It's like a prisoner who has just been released from prison, not knowing that driving is a chore. Having a car is a chore. Maintaining the car is a chore. Finding a good parking space is a chore. All of these things are problems that you have to deal with as a driver. Whereas if you always caught a ride with your friend, you don't have to worry about any of that. As I do most of the time. So the Imam says, minha. Don't expect all your problems to go away because you possess something new. وَلَا طَلَبِ مِحْمَدَةٍ عَلَيْهَا And don't expect when you give something that you will be thanked for that. Have no expectations. Sure, we are taught as part of our Islamic etiquette to thank the people who do favors for us, who grant us things, right? We're supposed to do that. But don't have that expectation. When you give someone, don't expect them to thank you. You're giving it because you're holding it in trust as we mentioned last night. بَلْ تَرَى فَوْتَهَا رَاحَ In fact, when you lose something, you think of it from this perspective, that now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making your life simpler. The fact that you have less, means there's less maintenance, less worry, less concern. بَلْ تَرَى فَوْتَهَا رَاحَةً وَكَوْنَهَا آفَةً And you consider having these possessions as being a matter of difficulty, a trial, a test from Allah. وَتَكُونُ أَبَدًا هَارِبًا مَنَ الْآفَةِ And you're always seeking comfort from these troubles. Anyway, so the Imam says, وَأَمِتْهُ بِالزَّهَادَةِ 
there are parts of your soul that have to be suppressed and subdued with asceticism, with having only the essentials, the things that you absolutely need. If you need one car, get one car. Why get two cars? If you need a car that's reliable and good, fine, get one. Why do you need a sports car? You see what I mean? People have this tendency, I have a good friend. His son is friends with someone who's a multi-billionaire. So the father was telling me, it's like my son hangs around with this guy. And every day they're jet setting. It's like his friend comes to him and he says to him, tomorrow let's go to Vegas. So they fly to Vegas in their private jet. The day after that, let's go to Paris. Let's shop on the Champs-Elysees. Let's go to London. Let's go here. Let's go there. And so he said to me that my son comes home, even though he's an affluent person, he's rather wealthy. He said, but that guy is just on a whole other level of wealth. We're talking multi-multi-billionaire. If I mention his name, you'll know him. He said that my son comes and every day he sees something new and he wants it. So he's like, dad, like they, they drive a pretty, you know, look, luxurious car. Don't get me wrong. It's like a Mercedes S-Class, top of the line or BMW 7, whatever. He says, but my son comes to me and he's like, I want a Lamborghini. Why can't I get a Lamborghini? I want a Ferrari. I want a Bugatti. And I tell him, like the father was telling me, it's like I tell him, listen, if you need a car, get a car. If you need a good car, get a good car. But why go for the ultra luxury? Why? This without a doubt distracts you from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is a proclivity and a ten tendency within all of us. Which is why Amir al-Mu'mineen says you have to subdue this. You have to suppress it. And you do so with asceticism. Only take the bare essentials that you need and that don't distract you from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then the Imam says, وَقَوِّهِ بِالْيَقِينَ And strengthen your soul with certainty. Certainty. Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam says, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. He says, لَمْ يُقْسَمْ بَيْنَ النَّاسِ شَيْءٌ أَقَلَّ مِنَ الْيَقِينَ You know, if you wanted to classify all the precious minerals on the planet, the most expensive would be the ones that have less abundance, right? The scarcest items and materials would be the most expensive. That's how it usually works. So plutonium or whatever happens to be expensive because it's scarce, it's not readily available everywhere. The Imam says that the scarcest thing that has been given to people, meaning from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is what? Certainty. Certainty is lacking. Which is why my belief is that disbelievers and people who follow deviant paths they will never achieve certainty in their false beliefs. Never. They might tell you that they're certain. They might tell you that they're fully confident of the teachings of their faith, but they don't have certainty. There's always this nagging doubt inside them. And even within the community of believers, certainty is a scarce thing. Amir al-Mu'mineen says you should seek certainty to embolden to strengthen your soul how do you do that well first of all you build on strong on a strong foundation you begin with the basics then you build that one step at a time you don't go left right and center you don't seek knowledge that is irrelevant to you you don't ask questions that are not pertinent to your development you build one step at a time on the strongest of founda foundations and you go all the way up to however far you can go. وَقَوِّهِ بِالْيَقِينَ Begin with belief that this world could not have originated without a creator. There is no way, no conceivable path to having anything exist without a creator. It's common sense. It's something that children understand, adults understand, everybody understands it. 
If you drove past this road every single day, and then you went away for a couple of years, then you came back and saw a new building, you know someone built this. You know someone brought it into existence. It didn't just come about magically. It makes no sense. If you believe that things could sprout into existence and just pop just like that, then you believe in magic. There's a word for that. It's magic and sorcery. So start there, then build your beliefs one step at a time. Prophethood, imamah, the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which are part of believing in Him, and ultimately with resurrection. That way you won't have any doubts, you won't have any misconceptions. The Imam then says, hikmah," And illuminate your heart with hikmah. But what is hikmah? You see, in some communities, they translate hikmah as philosophy. And al-hikmatul muta'aliya, which is the philosophy of Mullah Sadra, they translate it as transcendental philosophy. They like these big words, by the way. Haven't you noticed? They'll use these fancy schmancy expressions to make it sound like it's a big deal. I remember someone was telling me that I attended a lecture and the guy is a genius. Like he was telling me he's really, really smart. He knows his stuff. And I said, how do you know? He said, well, I didn't understand half the lecture. I said, the fact that you are ignorant and didn't understand half the things that he said, whether he is knowledgeable or not is another issue. But how is that an indication of his knowledge? And so they'll use these kinds of expressions and terminologies in order to deceive the unsuspecting individuals who might be conned into that. But... Hikmah in the language of the Qur'an, in the language of the traditions of the Ahlul Bayt, is wisdom. And wisdom is not philosophy. I'll tell you why, it's very simple. First of all, we have traditions from the Ahlul Bayt who condemn philosophers. And it's not just one or two or three or four ahadith, there's plenty of them. Philosophers are condemned. Greek philosophers, um, philosophers from other civilizations and communities. Philosophy as a science is condemned because it's so self-contradictory. It is so inconsistent and ultimately leads to disbelief and determinism and all the false and deviant ideas that Islam came to negate. These are things that philosophy promote. In one hadith in Tawheed al-Mufaddal, Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam says, فَتَبَّنْ وَتَعْسَنْ وَخَيْبَةً لِمُنْتَحِلِ الْفَلْسَفَةِ he says, cursed are the philosophers, those who ascribe themselves to philosophy, for how they've been blinded from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is one of the effects of philosophy, by the way. You, you don't find remembrance of Allah. It doesn't get, get you closer to God. It might revolve around theology, at least part of it, it might have God as the subject matter that they try to portray as some kind of a corpse that they put on the table to dissect him, to try and understand everything about God, which is the most futile thing anyone could ever do, right? But even though God could be the subject matter of philosophy, it doesn't get you any closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It gets you farther and farther away from Him. It doesn't make you connect with God, right? Now, what is hikmah in the language of the Qur'an? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَا لُقْمَانَ What? What did Allah give to Luqman? It wasn't prophethood as we mentioned a couple of nights ago. What was it? It was hikmah. So, was Luqman a philosopher? Well, let's see what Luqman had to say. Is, does this sound like philosophy to you? أَنِشْكُرْ لِلَّهِ Be thankful to Allah. Which part of this is about philosophy. Be grateful to your creator. This isn't philosophy. This is just plain wisdom. Again, you tell anyone wisdom, they'll know what we're talking about. It's not some convoluted, you know, elusive, strange, outworldly thing. It's just plain wisdom that you should be thankful to the one who granted you your very existence 
In another hadith, Imam al-Sadiq says, إِنَّ الْحَكْمَةَ Verily, hikma is al-ma'rifa. It is gnosis. It is to know yourself, your intrinsic weakness, your inherent vulnerability, your utter dependence on your Creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. إِنَّ الْحَكْمَةَ الْمَعْرِفَةَ وَالتَّفَقُّهَا فِي الدِّينَ It is also to become, to delve deep into religion and in particular, jurisprudence. فَمَنْ فَقَهَا مِنْكُمْ فَهُوَ حَكِيمٌ Whoever becomes a faqih, whoever becomes a jurist, whoever tries to understand his religion. And don't, don't get me wrong. Some people will present things about religious topics and they'll say that, no, 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 no. Don't worry about the apparent meaning of this. There's an esoteric meaning. There's a much deeper meaning that we have to dig into. And so they'll come up with something completely contradictory to the verse or the hadith of the Ahlul Bayt and say, that's the inner meaning of it. That's the deeper esoteric meaning of it. Don't do that. The Imams of the Ahlul Bayt never did that. The Holy Prophet never did that. The Qur'an wasn't revealed so that we would take it as some kind of cryptic messaging that we then have to get into and dig all the way deep into our inner Buddha to try and come up with some strange concept that appeals to the audiences and that makes people go wow. It doesn't work that way. Sure, there are verses in the Qur'an which are not readily understood and not easily deciphered. For those, you have to refer to the Ahlul Bayt Not to philosophy, not to Sufism, not to anything like this, but to the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt, which is why the Prophet said, إِنِّي تَارِكُمْ فِيكُمْ Kitab Allah. And what? Plato's philosophy? No. عِطْرَةِ أَهْلَ بَيْتِ And then you have imbeciles and imposters who say, Plato was a prophet. I think he was a prophet. You think he was a prophet? Who are you to assign prophethood to people? Who do you think you are? The entire struggle between believers and disbelievers since the dawn of humanity was on who represents Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who is a true prophet and who's a false prophet? I think Plato was a prophet. Even if Plato was a prophet, which of course he wasn't. Anyone who's familiar with his philosophy knows that he was a disbeliever. But even if he was, don't we have our own prophet? One day, Omar comes to the Holy Prophet and he says to him that I've been going to this Jewish monk and he's teaching me the Torah. And he's probably expecting the Prophet to give him a pat on the back and say, MashaAllah, SubhanAllah. Prophet said to him, what again? What was that? He said, I, I've been going to this Jewish monk and he's teaching me the Torah. The Prophet said, I bring you the unsullied, pure message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly. And you're going to someone else teaching some book that was without a doubt tampered with? Then the Prophet said this to him, listen carefully. He said, by God, if Musa was present today, he would have no other place to go to than to me. Plato is a prophet. May Allah raise you with Plato if you think he was a prophet. So, Imam al-Sadiq says, Hikmah is wisdom and knowledge of jurisprudence. Amir al-Mu'maneen then says, and I have to conclude. He says, وَذَلِّلْهُ بِذِكْرِ الْمَوْتِ and make your soul subdued by remembering death constantly. And we talked about this. And make your soul believe that it will end. That it will be annihilated. That there will come a point when it will, will no longer exist. Now you might say that is this a reference to the body or to the soul? The soul is supposed to live eternally, right? The answer to that is not necessarily. On the day of judgment, what we deduce from the traditions of the Ahlul Bayt, as far as I know anyway, is that not only will everyone die in the sayha, in the call that's made uh, in the heavens, not only will everyone die when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
is all alone, no one and nothing exists, right? That includes the souls. So even the souls will die. The souls are not eternal. The souls are material things that just happen to be created from a different type of substance. But they are material. They die. They're born. They, were, they came into existence. If you, ta- if you say that they're immaterial, as philosophers say, if you say that they are not physical, then how could they have a beginning? That means they're not confined by time and space and they have no beginning and they've always existed. Hence, Wahdatul Wujud. Hence, this false belief that everything is a part of the same substance that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This kufr that the scholars have clearly stipulated. If you believe in this, you become najis. You're no longer a believer. And show yourself the tragedies of this dunya. Again, don't just look at the good, also see the bad. If you want to tr- truly see the real genuine nature of this world, don't look for it in theme parks and in the movies and places where people are entertained. Go to the oncology department, the pediatric oncology department of your local hospital. Look at the children who are suffering from cancer. That is the true nature of this world. It's a world of suffering and pain and difficulty. You know the stuff that social media tries to filter out. Only shows you the nice stuff. وَحَذِّرْهُ صَوْلَةَ الدَّهْرُ وَفُحْشَ تَقَلُّبِ الْلَيَالِ وَالْعِيَامِ And warn yourself about the ambush of the time. How time ambushes us. What a beautiful expression. Think of 10 years ago and you'll see how you were ambushed by time. What just happened? 10 years evaporated into thin air. I was ambushed. It was stolen from me. It was taken away from me. And the next 10 years will be exactly the same. 10 years from now, you'll look back and say, SubhanAllah, what just happened? Fuhsh in the Arabic language means excess. Something that's too much. Right? They say, fahish. It means when something is way overpriced. The Imam says, remind yourself of the excessive nature of the days and nights and how they flip, how they change. One day this person was poor, the next day you look at him and he's incredibly wealthy. One day he was healthy, the next day he's sick. Things don't remain in a constant state. They always change. So don't be deceived by the situation that you're in right now. You're subject to change without notice. Things could spiral out of control without you even knowing. وَعْرِضْ عَلَيْهِ أَخْبَارَ الْمَاضِينَ Present to yourself the news of the people that have passed. Look at those who came before you and what they went through and what happened to them. وَذَكِّرْهُ بِمَا أَصَابَ مَنْ كَانَ قَبْلَكَ مِنَ الْأَوَّلِينَ And remind yourself of what occurred to those who came in the early days of humanity. وَسِرْ فِي دِيَارِهِمْ The Imam says, walk in their dwellings, in their towns and cities. وَآثَارِهِمْ Look at their ruins. فَانْظُرْ مَا فَعَلُوا وَعَمَّنْ تَقَلُوا وَأَيْنَ حَلُوا وَنَزَلُوا It's beautiful how the Imam articulates these things. He says, go and look at the ruins of the ancient civilizations. The Incas, this, the Pharaohs and the Egyptians. Look at what they've done. But where are they now? Where are they? Entire civilizations vanish, let alone this Mahdi al-Mudarrisi. You think I'm here as a constant? I'm always going to be around. Entire civilizations disappear from the face of the earth. And all you end up with is some relics that you put in a museum where people walk past them and maybe stare at them for two seconds. That's it. They're gone. No matter how powerful they were, when people are often, you know, they become nationalistic, right? It's like, yeah, my country this, we have this, we have that. Do do you know how many times the world map has changed since the dawn of humanity? Countries come and go, empires fall down, nothing is constant. Remind yourself of that, the Imam says. 
فإنك تجده من تقلوا عن الأحبة وحلوا دار الغربة وكأنك عن قليل قد صرت كأحدهم I'll conclude with this The Imam says You'll find that they left their loved ones and they ended up in a lonely place and it's as if you will also shortly be one of them you'll also be one of the people who's forgotten no one remembers them your own great grandson will probably not know your name think about that do you know your great grandfather's name how about your great grandmother's name do you ever remember them even if you know your name their name do you remember them do you recite fatiha for them do you do anything good on their behalf it's you and I all by ourselves. We're, we're all on our own brothers and sisters. Our own actions, our own deeds, or lack thereof, I should say. How will we go and face Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Are we really relying on our family to remember us? On my children to care about me? On my grandchildren to remember their great-grandfather? People who internalize this, they'll recognize that death is imminent. And if death is imminent, and that they're on their own, they have to prepare themselves. They have to do whatever it takes to please the creator of the universe, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who brought us into this world, who cared enough about me to create me, and has promised that if I obey him, he will immortalize me. He will grant me things beyond my wildest imaginations. In paradise, the hadith says, you will find things Things that no eye has ever seen, no ear has ever heard the depiction of, or the description of. And no heart has ever imagined. Human imagination is pretty wild. If you're into science fiction, for example, you'll know that humans are able to create some great fantastical worlds. Those people who write novels, who make movies, right? They have pretty wild imaginations. They can create fantastical worlds. And yet, the Imam tells us that in paradise, you will find things that no one was even able to conceptualize or imagine. People who understand this realize that their time in this world is worth only as much as the deeds they offer for it. Which is why they're ready at a moment's notice. He comes to his father. Imam al Hussein was asleep. The Imam wakes up and starts saying, Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un. His son Ali al Akbar came to him. He said, Father, why are you saying this? The Imam indicated to him that this caravan is going, but it won't come back the same. That our death is approaching. So Ali al Akbar says to Abu Abdullah al Hussein, he said, Abba, I have a question. Are we not truthful? Awalasna ala al haqq? Don't we follow the path of righteousness? The Imam said, absolutely. With conviction, with certainty. Yes, of course we are. Ali al Akbar replied by saying, Idan, if that's the case, la nubali. We don't care. Waqa'na ala al haqq am waqa'na ala al maut am waqa'a al mawtu alayna. Whether we fall on to death and we approach it ourselves or death falls upon us and approaches us, it doesn't matter. As long as we're on the right path. 